I'm not capable to do the same that he did, but uh, you can imagine. So, thank you. It's a beautiful place. The only issue is that there are so many lights that it's difficult to see you, but I hope to imagine where you are. In any case, uh, as has been said, this is my title. What is it? Is there? But uh, when I started really to prepare it, I took very seriously what is the specific title of this conference, or this uh, fest, that is after the golden rush, the gold rush. And I tried to understand what could be the meaning. I read a very interesting paper written, and I tried to make my mind, and my mind arrived to this conclusion, that I want to talk to you about something that can be named disruptive normality. I will try to explain you in the few minutes of my speech what it is about. But uh, before that, I want to give a little bit of the context. I promised myself not to start any public lecture in the, this month without dealing with migration. And I think somebody could say, what is the relationship between migration and the topic that we have here? I think that what we are witnessing with this uh, migration issue in Europe and in the world, but I refer mainly to Europe, it's related to everything. So our country and our region is showing all the fragility of our society. And the fragility of the society is given by the fact that there are some fake fear that imagine something that apparently we cannot bear. And therefore we have a kind of a tragically collapse of European uh, ethical positions. This is why I think uh, that we have to, in some way, to try to find a link in between whatever important as this uh, initiative is uh, with the, the tragedy. That is not only the tragedy of the migrants, it's a tragedy for the Europeans, and I would say for all the planet in some way. In principle, we know what we should do. We have already several good examples we can share. So there is a lot about sharing to try to solve the problem. We can share houses, we can share cars, we can share community gardens, we can share activities. So there is a lot of sharing that can bring to what we can call a collaborative inclusion. And I think that uh, this is something that we can think about when we will have our discussion. But in my view, there is something that is even more challenging, that is the need to create a narrative. I think that uh, the fair is mainly because the only narrative is the narrative of a fake Europe with a community that is Christian, homogeneous, stable, that is in some way destabilized by this migrant flow. This is, in my view, I don't know what you think, I hope that you share with me, it's a fake vision. Europe is not stable, it's not homogeneous, it's not only Christian since time. But this is the idea, and this is a very strong narrative. We have to imagine and invent a new narrative. And the new narrative should talk about a more, a younger, more dynamic, more cosmopolitan Europe. And I think that a young, dynamic and cosmopolitan movement as a sharing uh, movement could and should bring a contribution to that. Therefore, I think that uh, a kind of reality check that we should do at the end of this meeting and ask uh, to ourselves if doing what we have done, we have created some uh, possibility for collaborative uh, practices, and most importantly for me, if we have given some contribution to create a more cosmopolitan Europe. Given that, we can move to a real topic, so after the gold rush. What is the meaning about after the gold rush? For what I understood, and not to explain, because it's been very well written in the, in the paper that prepared this conference, it's a kind of quasi-disillusion. So something was there, we imagined to do incredible, beautiful things, now somebody succeeds, somebody not, and some idea turned to be the contrary of what was the beginning. And therefore, what we do now, how we settle down, has been said in these new conditions. 
Somebody says, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, this is the history of every possible innovation. You start from some enthusiasts that are very committed as kind of heroes. They do something breaking all the rules. And afterward, maybe you have a kind of movement, some many people that are committed in going in the same directions. And afterward, you land uh, in a kind of a normality if things go on. Because this is the rule of, of the every movement. They have a kind of a trajectory, and the trajectory always move from heroes that start to do something, changing everything in their own life and putting themselves with all the body and spirit in this new adventure. And afterward, uh, all, all this die or is normalized. Now the issue, in my, in my view, this is a really big issue for all of us, is do normalization means only one thing? So it's mandatory that normalization means to go back to a kind of a normally mainstream economy that in the case will be to go toward a kind of 21st century new liberalism? Or there are other possibilities? And how we can work on these other possibilities? And uh, so this is a discussion about uh, how we can uh, manage something that is very normal, that is the trajectory of every possible new ideas toward something that could be normal. And normal is not bad, because normal could mean that your idea is shared by much more people than before. So could we have the challenge of uh, not imagining only that uh, normality, that means uh, the mainstream economy, but can we imagine something else? And here is the track, the, the issue, how we can put together the idea to be more normal and the idea of maintaining some values. They were the original values. And this is why I call it a disruptive normality. Because in this ideal perspective that I try to draw, we should imagine uh, normal people, normal families, that doing something that for them is very obvious, all together do something that is against the mainstream ideas about, ideal, about economy, about society, society, etc. Let me make some example where <coughs> the normalization as uh, going toward the 21st century uh, Neoliberalism is quite dis discussed, so I will not to talk about uh, the platform economy, the uberization in the worst sense of the term. What could be a good example? So what could be this uh, normal way of living that at the same time could be disruptive? So I will make one example that is uh, very, very well known, very classic, so everybody can immediately understand. Everybody knows about, for instance, the community gardens. So if you go to New York, that's where probably the movement of the community gardens started, you can find now 400 community gardens. And if you go there, they still have this flavor of a place where people are not only working and creating some green space, but they are also creating some social fabric, some links in between them. You can find the normal families, they do it. You can find that people are not to change totally their own life. Nevertheless, a community garden is totally outside from what are the mainstream ideas and practice about uh, the 21th century neoliberalist cities. Therefore, it means that something happened that permits to these people to have a normal life at the same time to move in a direction that is a contrary of the mainstream. And the same could be if you go to a farmer market here. That is very normal, everybody can do it. But at the same time, if people that are going to the farmer market, they are clashing against all the discussion about uh, the, the big corporation, about uh, the hyper-industrialized and chemical-intensive food and agriculture. So this, for me, is the story, how we can generate it. And if you look, uh, I, took, I go back to my first example, simply because it's the best known, and you try to see what happened, is that uh, the community garden today are in some way the result of a kind of balance in between the bottom-up, 
So people doing things, because if there are not people willing to do things, nothing happens. But uh, on the fences of these gardens, you find a post uh, something written that is uh, Green Thumb, New York City Council. So they are also part of something that has been a kind of top-down, the capability to reorganize the system in a certain way. So this kind of dialogue in between uh, something that is a bottom-up, capability to design and capability of the organization to take care very slightly. So now I have to, to run because I see that my time is running on. But uh, it's very a kind of art, the one of how the institution can interact not to kill the spontaneously and the capability of people to take care of, in this case, a community garden, and at the same time to give some limits that permit to all this story to be much more normal, as I said. So this is uh, what I intend as uh, disruptive uh, normality. And again, the, the kind of uh, question that we can have is if the sharing movement is capable to last in time maintaining these original social values, and uh, to maintain the original social values, in my view, uh, is, uh, could be called as this kind of distru disruptive uh, normality. But afterward, the last uh, step could be but, uh, how we can evaluate if we are going toward this disruptive normality or not. Probably there are many different uh, facets, things can be told in uh, many different ways, for me, there is one main point. Collaborating is very human. Collaborating is a way to get in touch one with the other one, doing something together to get a result. But the way in which you have to get a result asks for some very special encounters. So we have to trust each other. We have to, in some way, have the same language. We have to have uh, the same uh, rules, at least for this collaboration. And we have to share some goals. So it's human. But it's also a, a cultural construction. We have to make something happen. So the mainstream is, uh, as uh, Richard Sennett, maybe uh, many of you know, has uh, written this fantastic book uh, called Together, say our society are de-skilling us in collaborating. So it's true that human beings, a social animal, are capable to collaborate. So it's possible to think collaboration as a normality for human beings. But we can have a skill in collaborating or being the skilled in collaborating. So in my view, the check to see if we are in the right track or not is if while we get some result, we are also producing trust, empathy, mutual care, friendliness, that all together can be called relational goods. And therefore, the, qu the question could be, how does uh, a given sharing idea that we are considering promote or not relational good. And in my view, if you do not promote relational good, it means that we are not in the good track by this point of view. And uh, the issue, if you want, the design issue is how to balance effectiveness and relational goods. Because it has to be no known that uh, to open yourself, to trust in each other, to have relationships, it's uh, requiring a lot. It's not so simple. You don't do it uh, every time, every day, in every moment. Therefore, this is the art of designing, sharing ideas. It's how you manage to make it the threshold more accessible so you enlarge the number of people that can participate and the number of time in their own life that they will to participate and collaborate. And at the same time, how you maintain different levels of these uh, relational goods. Thank you. Thank you.